But there's a different set of ways to do it. You could make a device that displays a different image in each window. That is, you take a bunch of pictures of a scene and then just use one fast projector to magically beam light into a whole bunch of different angular directions so that when you're standing there you see just what your eye is supposed to. So you've thrown away the hundred projectors and replace it with just one or, or eight or something like that. Uh, one trick of doing this I believe came out of uh, Adrian Travis's lab which was really clever in which there was one high-speed cathode ray tube that would show over and over again what the scene looks like from different points of view. Uh, there would be a liquid crystal shutter that would have one window open at a time um, in the Fourier plane of this lens system. That would go onto a big Fresnel lens, which is your field lens, and then when you put your eyes or your head inside these viewing zones, you could, you could see it. So instantaneously, only one of those viewing zones would have imagery that you could see. But when you turn it on, that shutter moves really fast so that you really can't tell it's a scanning system. It seems as if it's on all the time, and you get a 3D image that you could see. Um, so this is a photograph of how, how they did it at Cambridge. You can see inside they actually had to merge all the light from these um, red, green, and blue CRTs. And it produced, they made uh, several movies that you could watch, and when you move your head back and forth you could look around those cartoon characters. Now, uh, in the third class we're going to talk about even more of view sequential 3D displays, which I personally strongly recommend as the way to go. Uh, this is an example that uh, Actuality Systems made, which is a vibrating lenticular display. Here there's just one off-the-shelf projector from Dell with modified electronics and a fast DMD projector. I talked about DMDs in the last class. It goes through an aperture and then strikes a special arrangement of lenticulars which actually vibrates very rapidly. And you can see a really great deep 3D image that you want to reach out and touch. And I'll be talking about this and other more complicated systems in the next class. So we've just discussed stereoscopes, parallax barrier displays, integral photography, lenticular displays, and multi-view displays. Uh, next, let's get into volumetric displays. So a volumetric display is a system whose imagery really does take up a volume in space. It's much, much less of an illusion than the other displays. So if you were to... Uh, here's a photograph of a canonical 3D display called a cathode ray sphere made by Barry Blundell who's a real um, expert and historian in the field of volumetric 3D, an image of a little stick figure walking. If you were to walk around this display, it would be as if the stick figure is there, and you could even move your head up to the top and look down and see the stick figure's head. There are quite a few ways to do it. Um, one of the earliest patents on 3D, in, on volumetric display, was from Baird, the same person credited for inventing the television. Uh, in this case, you could see a number of stalks, which are numbered 16, each of which are mounted on a disc, and uh, each of those stalks has several lights on it. And then there's a spinning um, disc in front of it with some holes in it arranged in a spiral. And when this apparatus spins, you get an opportunity to blink light through any of, I don't know, 100 or 200 or so voxels, which are 3D pixels in space. And if you do it fast enough and it's all synchronized just right, you see a 3D image. Another way to do this is to move the screen back and forth. This is a paddle wheel based display from the 1970s where the paddles uh, rotate and in doing so translate towards and away from the viewer. And while that happens, light shines through film uh, to show slices of an image. And I think this was used to show three-dimensional ultrasound. And there are a whole bunch of other early volumetric displays which are sort of fun to read about. They use a variety of uh, really unusual vibrating light blinking techniques. The volumetric display that I know best is the one that we used to make uh, called Perspecta. Perspecta was the world's highest resolution volumetric display and had 100 million 3D pixels or voxels. Uh, you could see the exploded view on the right. The way that it worked was as follows. First you take a 3D scene that you want to render and software would slice that up to 200 thin wedges, just like you're slicing an apple around its core. That's projected through a fast projection engine using three TI DMDs running at 6,000 frames per second. And that light, uh, those patterns of light, illuminate a rotating screen. So you could see this kind of cake pan, we call it, takes up the top half of the display, and it's got a periscope 
and several relay mirrors and a screen, all those things rotate together. So regardless of how it's rotated, the focus is always the same. And then you see this nice full color 3D image that you could see from any point of view. And the, the whole screen would rotate at about 900 RPM. Uh, and based on the way that it works, it ended up becoming a 30 hertz image. Quite a bit of electronics was required to pull this off around 2001, 2002. Um, it had uh, uh, electronics inside that we called Blackjack, and that had a little embedded computer in it running Linux, as well as an NVIDIA GPU which rendered all the voxels. So data would come in off of Ethernet, you just connect it to a simple PC. It would be uh, processed in an Athlon 64 and a GPU, and the processed voxels would sit in a large chunk of memory on the order of gigabytes, which was a lot then, and would then drive DMDs at 6,000 frames per second. So that's uh, 3 gigabytes per second in aggregate, and that's the same order of magnitude as our back of the envelope calculation in the first class. Here's a photograph of that electronics board, where you can see the main processor, uh, the input Ethernet, and the GPU as well as what the customer received is this nice uh, perspective display. Here are images generated by uh, the volumetric display. This is a CAT scan in several different colors and if you were to walk around it you can see different aspects of the patient depending on where you're standing. Now you can zoom in and zoom out and um, change how the density of the CAT scan is mapped to different colors. That lets a doctor understand where a tumor is for example with respect to the anatomy. Here's um, the most recent version of Perspecta. This is an image of how you might use it to do cancer treatment planning in something called external beam radiation uh, therapy. Here you can see the CAT scan of a patient lying down looking up at the ceiling and this green shaft of energy coming down from the upper left down to the lower right. And that is an example of uh, where an energy beam would go to uh, attack a tumor. So that's all I have to say about the perspective volumetric display. There are other types of volumetric displays. A whole family of them uses a physics or a quantum mechanical technique called upconversion, or uh, two-photon, two-step upconversion. One of the ones that was uh, historically best known was made by Elizabeth Downing at 3D Technology Laboratories. And in her case, she made a special type of glass uh, that was doped with rare earth ions like uh, prasodymium and erbium, which would glow if two infrared laser beams crisscrossed. So at that crisscross point you get a little glowing dot. So to make a 3D image you can blink the lasers on and off while scanning the lasers with some mirrors. Another company more recently working on this is 3D Icon in the US. From time to time people ask me if it's possible just to shoot 3D images in the air and finally it turns out it is possible. Uh, AIST and Hamamatsu have put a lot of resources into getting this done. I believe they use uh, lasers that are so strong that you ionize the air. You create a plasma and it creates uh, this popping noise that's fairly loud and a bright dot. And if you could steer that point around, they create floating three-dimensional images. And the ones that I saw are maybe a few feet big in diameter. Also, there's been a lot of research in what liquid you could use. So if you imagine just a glass of tap water uh, and shine lasers into it, can you make a 3D image float inside there? And it turns out you can. And I believe the results of their research was that of all the many, you know, hundred or so chemicals they studied, water was actually the best, uh, tap water. 